Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Remember to like and subscribe for a better time next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Dio Brando from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, a real jerk, a bad stepbrother, and a complete monster. If you're a member of my Patreon, you know I post monthly schedule updates letting you know what builds are coming. The video scheduled for today was Geralt from The Witcher, but I haven't had time to play it before the holiday break, so it's getting pushed back a bit. What I'm saying is, you may have been expecting Geralt, but it was Dio. I can show you the world. Edgy but still so splendid Tell me Jojo, now when did you last get punched in the face? Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need to effectively be immortal. Vampirism has its perks. Next, we need some necrotic damage, something to really cut into the health of our annoying good boy stepbrother. Finally, we need a stand that will stand the test of time and test the standing of time by stopping it. For stats, we're using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just make sure your dexterity and wisdom are high. Before we dive in, let's remember that there are limitations as to what you can have for stats in a tabletop game that aren't there for creators of anime. An average anime character has 20s in every stat as a minimum, capping somewhere around the 82 range depending on your series of choice. So remember the rule of relativity and this should go fine. Dexterity will be number one, Dio punches real fast and doesn't wear heavy armor. The way this build goes, dexterity will also affect the power of the punch, so that's nice, and will let us get away with a lower strength score. Wisdom after that, your senses are incredibly sharp, and you're really good at reading people. Even though you use that skill for evil, you still have it. Constitution next, vampires are pretty hard to kill. Follow that up with charisma, you're a liar, an intimidating liar. That's two skills. Scary. Strength is a little low, we just need other things more, and we'll drop intelligence. Dio is very smart, but we don't really need it for anything in this build. Let's talk vampire races in 5e. You can't really switch races mid-game without your DM setting something up narratively, so we'll start off as a vampire. There's a Magic the Gathering expansion for D&D called Plane Shift Zendikar, with a vampire race officially from Wizards of the Coast, which meets my requirements for authenticity. If you're playing in an Adventure League legal setting, this build just straight up won't work anyway, but an elf would work fine, probably a drow. Vampires get plus one intelligence and plus two charisma, 60 feet of dark vision, vampiric resistance for resistance to necrotic damage, and can use bloodthirst. This lets you make a special melee attack against a creature that is either willing, incapacitated, restrained, or grappled by you. Deals one piercing damage plus one d6 necrotic damage, reducing the target's total HP and restoring your HP equal to the necrotic damage. Build your own background for intimidation and deception proficiency to con your way into a rich dude dude's house. You could consider this a variation of the charlatan background if you wanted. Kick things off as a monk. First level monks can learn two skills from the monk list. Athletics and insight will help you read people to figure out how to better manipulate them. You get unarmored defense, making your AC 10 plus your dexterity and wisdom modifier when you're not wearing armor. That's just 14 at the moment, nothing to write home about, but it lets you use martial arts, which bumps your unarmed attacks up to D4s, and you can use your dexterity modifier for the attack and damage rolls while making an unarmed attack as a bonus action after you take the attack action for faster punches. Maybe even jab your thumb in the eye. You're a rat bastard after all. To do this build in narrative order, we need some vampiric powers before we get a stand. So let's get these out of the way. First level clerics can choose a domain and that might seem like a weird pick unless you consider the death domain. For a god, pick yourself. You really are that vain after all. This gives you the reaper ability which lets you learn a necromancy cantrip from any list. Chill touch lets you make a ranged spell attack dealing 1d8 necrotic damage and preventing the target from healing. It's a ghost hand with a range of 120 feet, so it's not super in character at the moment, but maybe once you've activated your stand, it'll make more sense. When you use this or any other necromancy cantrip, you can target two creatures instead of one. You do have two hands after all. Toll of the Dead is another necromancy cantrip. That's actually from the cleric list. It forces a wisdom saving throw on a creature, dealing 1d8 necrotic damage if they fail and have full health, and 1d12 if they don't have full health. Spread the love with the Reaper ability, and by love, I mean life-draining energy. For your other two cantrips, Guidance and Resistance, give a creature you touch an extra d4 to add to ability checks and saving throws respectively. You can cast these on yourself to get a little stronger. Speaking of getting a little stronger, let's grab some first level spells. The Death Domain list gives you the False Life spell, giving you 1d4 plus 4 temporary HP for an hour, no concentration required. From that same bonus list, Ray of Sickness is a ranged spell attack that deals 2d8 poison damage and forces a constitution saving throw on the target. 
target. Failing it, they're poisoned until the end of your next turn. These spells are free from your domain, though it still costs spell slots to use them. You can prepare an amount of spells equal to your cleric level plus your wisdom modifier per long rest, but we don't need that many more from the regular cleric list to fit the build. Inflict Wounds is a melee spell attack that deals 3d10 necrotic damage. No muss, no fuss, it's pretty simple life destruction. Bane Force is a charisma saving throw on up to three creatures of your choice, forcing them to subtract a d4 to any attack roll or saving throw for up to a minute depending on your concentration. Second level clerics can channel divinity. All clerics can turn undead, forcing a wisdom saving throw on undead creatures and making them run away if they fail, but come on, why would you do that? That's your army. So instead, try Touch of Death, which lets you add necrotic damage to a melee attack equal to 5 plus twice your cleric level. So, 9 at this point. That's basically an extra attack, and necrotic is much less commonly resisted than bludgeoning. Third level clerics can learn second level spells, and now it's time to talk about the world. The ice caps are melting at an exponential rate, causing sea levels to rise- oh, sorry, wait, no, the world is Dio's stand, with the ability to stop time. There's a spell that does this in D&D, but it's 9th level, which means 17 levels of either wizard or sorcerer, and if you're doing the math, you know that's an impossibility at this point. Investing that heavily in a casting class basically means that a stand is virtually impossible for us to get, and investing that much for the time stop spell is really, really not worth it. As a spell, it gives you between two to five turns to take actions and bonus actions as normal while everyone else is frozen. But if you move a thousand feet away or mess with any creatures, the spell ends early. Considering there are other ninth level spells that instantly kill someone or summon a dinosaur extinction level meteor swarm, 12 to 30 seconds of personal time is super weak. So instead, let's look at something that fills the role of time stop, locking your foe in place so you can beat the living hell out of them. Hold person is a second level spell. It forces a wisdom saving throw on a creature. Failing that, they're paralyzed for up to a minute depending on your concentration. They can re-roll the save at the end of each of their turns, but paralysis is really nasty. You have advantage to hit them and critically hit them every time you do. Considering how many attacks you're going to have by the end of this, that's nuts. Now let's get back to Monk. Second level monks get unarmored movement, making you faster when you're not wearing armor. Your fashion sense is eccentric, but not heavy. Nothing you'd wear I'd consider armor. You also get key points that you can spend to do cool vampire stuff, like Step of the Wind to dash and disengage as a bonus action with doubled jump distance. Patient Defense lets you dodge as a bonus action for advantage on dexterity saves and to give your enemies disadvantage to hit you. The most in-character option, I think, is Flurry of Blows, letting you make two unarmed attacks instead of one as a bonus action for a big string of punches. Third level monks can deflect missiles, letting you reduce the damage of a ranged attack by 1d10 plus your dexterity modifier and monk level. If you drop that to zero, you can toss it back as a bonus action. If anyone wants to hurt you, they have to approach you. Speaking of part three, let's grab a stand. The Way of the Astral Self comes from an unearthed arcana that I will remind everyone came out after I built Jotaro, so I couldn't use it at that point. You get Arms of the Astral Self first, letting you spend two key points as a bonus action to use your wisdom modifier instead of strength for strength checks and saves. These arms are monk weapons with a 10 foot range that you can use your wisdom modifier for instead of strength or dexterity for attack rolls and deal radiant or necrotic damage instead of bludgeoning. You can use them to make an attack as a bonus action, but can't flurry with them. However, you will get an automatic flurry with them later in the build. Some people think that this subclass gets a little broken at later levels. They're right. Fourth level monks get slow fall, letting you reduce falling damage by five times your monk level as a reaction. You also get an ability score improvement, and I'm going to recommend wisdom here. Works with your astral arms, bumps your wisdom saves and strength saving throws, and your AC and hold person spell DC as well. It's really good for you. Fifth level monks get stunning strike, letting you spend a key point to force a constitution save of eight plus your proficiency and wisdom modifier on a creature you hit with a melee attack. Failing that, they're stunned until your next turn. This will give you advantage on all follow-up attacks, so it's a nice alternative for when you You've used your hold person slots. You also get an extra attack, letting you attack twice instead of once as your action, so that's three attacks per round so far, with more on the way. Your martial arts die also bumps up to a d6 for more potential damage. Sixth level monks get key empowered strikes, making your unarmed strikes magical in terms of overcoming resistances, which will help you against star platinum. Astral self monk can also summon a visage of the astral self with a key point and a bonus action, or you can do it while summoning your astral arms to save time. While this is active, you have advantage on insight and intimidation checks, and a 120 feet of dark vision that works with darkness and magical darkness. This is very helpful considering your opinions on natural lighting. It's bad. Seventh level monks get stillness of mind, letting you spend an action to remove an effect of charming or frightening on yourself, though I'm not sure that there's much that could scare you. You also have evasion, meaning that you take half damage on a failed deck save and no damage on a successful one. Burning buildings are nothing to you. Who cares about a little fire? Eighth level monks get another ability score improvement. More wisdom will make you an even bigger pain in the ass for the Joestar family, and really, isn't that the goal? Ninth level monks get unarmored movement improvement, letting you move up walls and over water while not wearing armor as long as you end your turn somewhere solid. 
solid. Dio can fly, but we can't really get that in this build with all the other goals being met. This should help your mobility enough to compensate. 10th level monks get purity of body, making you immune to poison and disease. Vampires run around ingesting other people's blood for sustenance. It's pretty gross, but also impressive that they never get sick. That's a powerful immune system. 11th level astral self monks get awakened astral self, meaning that while you have the astral visage and astral arm summoned, you get a little extra extra benefit. You can deflect energy to reduce damage from acid, cold, fire, lightning, or force damage by 1d10 plus your wisdom modifier and monk level as a reaction. Word of the spirit lets you whisper to someone 30 feet away or make your voice boom 600 feet away, and empowered arms lets you add your monk die in damage to one attack with your astral arms per round. That's the same damage as a critical hit, but it isn't a critical hit, meaning that when it is a critical hit, it's a double critical hit big damage. You can also make two attacks as a bonus action with your astral arms, basically giving you a free flurry of blows every round, and your martial arts die increases to a d8. This is a good level for you if that wasn't very clear. 12th level monks get another ability score improvement, and we can finally cap our wisdom. It's about damn time. That means maximum damage on all four of your attacks per round with the astral arms for 4d8 plus 20 necrotic damage per round. I like that. 13th level monks get Tongue of the Sun and Moon, letting you understand all spoken languages and people can understand you as well. This is the first anime character we've built that comes complete with an automatic dub. It's pretty great. 14th level monks get Diamond Soul, giving you proficiency with every saving throw and letting you re-roll failed saving throws by spending a key point. That means anytime you make a save, your minimum modifier is plus 5, and you can give yourself advantage if you need to. They say Diamond is unbreakable after all. 15th level monks get Timeless Body, meaning you no longer feel the effects of old age and don't need to eat or drink. Honestly, this ability is mostly for flavor, but you keep getting more key points at every level as well, so it's not a huge waste. 16th level monks get our last ability score improvement. Round off your dexterity and constitution for better AC and HP. Remember, bumping your constitution modifier works retroactively, raising your HP by 19 at this level. That's pretty nice. Our capstone is the 17th level of Astral Self Monk. Outside of Archdruid, this might be one of the most powerful abilities in the game. Complete Astral Self lets you spend 10 key points to summon a full on stand, giving you all the benefits of your astral arms, astral visage, and awakened astral self, and armor of the spirit for plus 2 AC, astral barrage for a third attack with your attack action, and key consumption, letting you steal key points equal to your wisdom modifier when a creature within 10 feet of you drops to 0 HP. It's a nice little vampiric ability right there at the end. Also, your astral arms can now make 3 attacks as a bonus action for 6 attacks per round, and each attack now deals 1d10 with your martial arts die. Is that good? Well, now that we've hit level 20, let's figure it out. Your damage output is 7d10 plus 30 necrotic damage per round, which is more damage than the 7th level spell Finger of Death, and you can do it every round. Oh, and if you're holding a person, that's 14d10 plus 30 necrotic damage thanks to those automatic critical hits. Yikes! You also have great methods to avoid damage, deflect missiles, deflect energy, and evasion can really help you cut down on incoming hits, not to mention 20 AC with all your astral self stuff up. Finally, you've got mobility options with 55 base speed, step of the wind, and free climbing speed to go wherever you need to go. For weaknesses, that astral stuff costs 10 key points, which you can recover when you kill someone, sure, but if you don't, that's stopping you from doing all your other fun monk stuff. You've also got very limited spell slots. Two uses of hold person per day will go away really quickly. Finally, for a frontline fighter, your HP is somewhere in the 150 range, which can go away pretty quickly, but the HP of your enemy is going to be going down much faster. Drain all the life from your foes and stand tall and proud. Just watch out for someone else with a stand. That's really the one thing that could approach you in terms of power. Thanks for watching. Again, Geralt is coming. I just didn't have time to dive into The Witcher. Hopefully you all get it. Check out my Let's Play channel, support the Patreon, and I hope you all had a wonderful holiday. We'll see you on New Year's Eve with an electrifying video.